Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday. We're talking about the Pachamama ceremony or the incident at the Vatican back in 2019, and we're going to go over the whole thing and explain it. Joined by Father Deacon Anthony Dragani to do this. Father Deacon, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. How you been? Oh, thank you, Michael. I'm doing great. I love being here with you. It's always a pleasure. Oh, yeah. And, and I learn every time. And look, you're a religious studies professor. And so this is right up your alley. So I think that you have some contributions that you can make to the discussion that is unique in comparison to many others who have commented on this, including myself. So yeah. I look forward to, you know, to hearing your perspective and learning, because like I said, I mean, I'm not a religious studies professor, so I don't have the kind of perspective that you do. So I'm really excited to hear about this. Um, so, yeah, tell us um, a little bit about the background here and just kind of take the discussion wherever you want to go. Sure. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is talk a bit about my own background in religious studies. Mm -hmm. So you know where I'm coming from. Sure. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the controversy, and then I'm going to take us through the ritual that took place, you know, the, yep. the whole ceremony step by step and explain every piece of it while showing a video. Excellent. So okay. uh, my background is in religious studies. I have a bachelor's degree in religious studies as well as philosophy. And uh, in that degree, I studied all the religions of the world, the major ones, of course. Mm -hmm. But I took courses specifically in things such as ritual, mythology. And for about 23 years now, I've been teaching world religions as a course. Mm -hmm. So during that period, I've gotten very familiar with things such as animism, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, Islam, of course, Judaism. And I've spent a lot of time, especially delving into the ceremonies and rituals practiced in these various religions and the meanings behind them. So one thing that I've studied quite a bit is animism. And animism is the traditional religion of the people of the Amazon. I don't claim to be an expert on, you know, Amazonian religion or Amazonian culture or rituals, but I know enough about animism in general to know what it is and what it isn't. Now, I want to be clear, when we're talking about indigenous religions, there are literally thousands of different ones. No two are exactly alike, but there are certain, certain common patterns that they follow. So that's where I'm coming from, as somebody who studies this and teaches this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when the whole... Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. So when the whole Pachamama controversy erupted, mm -hmm. um, the way I first discovered it was probably like you did on social media, people yeah. talking about it. Yep. And um, what I first saw reported was that there was a pagan ritual at the Vatican in which people from the Amazon brought an idol of Pachamama with them. And that they put this idol there and in front of the Pope, uh, they worshiped Pachamama. That's the story I first heard. I imagine that's what you heard as well, correct? That's right. Oh, yeah. That and videos. Yeah. <laughs> so hearing that, my my alarms went off. Right. Because it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make sense. Because from what I know, and I've, I've since researched this further to confirm it, mm -hmm. uh, Pachamama historically was an Incan goddess, you know, the Incan people. Sure. From the Andes region. Mm-hmm. Uh, not from the Amazon. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the people of the Amazon never worshipped Pachamama, ever. She was not an, a, a goddess to them. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, typically there were no goddesses to them because the people of the Amazon were, for the most part, animists. And for those who aren't familiar with it, animism is a religious system in which they view nature as being full of spirits. So they believe that all elements of nature have spirits. Uh, you know, perhaps water could have spirits, the earth, perhaps trees. They see spirits in all of creation. And for that reason, they tend to treat creation with reverence and care. Uh -huh. uh, the Native American religions were largely animistic, for example. Typically, these religions do not have gods and goddesses. Uh, an animist wouldn't have a statue of a goddess that they worshipped. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer there. It's possible that there were some you know, people in the Amazon who were right next to the Andes and picked up the Incan gods and worshipped mm -hmm. them. That's possible. Anything is possible. But in general, the vast majority of people in the Amazon, the tribes there, would never have worshipped Pachamama. And as a matter of fact, they wouldn't have statues of any gods or goddesses because okay. that was not what they worshipped. 
A great way of illustrating animism, by the way, is uh, you may recall the old Disney movie Pocahontas. Yeah. Do you remember uh, in the film, Pocahontas goes into the forest and there's this old willow tree she has discussions with. Mm -hmm. the tree is alive and full of wisdom. Mm -hmm. that, that pretty much encapsulates the typical animist worldview. The nature is alive. The nature has you know a spiritual power within it and you communicate with it. It's there. It's all around us. Mm. So again, an animist wouldn't have a statue of Pachamama. So when I heard this, it wasn't adding up. Why would people from the Amazon be bringing with them a statue of an Incan goddess whom they never worshipped, never had any devotion to? As a matter of fact, they never even had idols in the Amazon. So why would they have an idol to worship? Granted, they had images and things, but they didn't have idols of gods they worshipped. That was not a thing in the Amazon ever. Again, there may have been exceptions, but it made no sense. And it, yeah. uh, an example of how um, how I saw this. So Libya. Libya, geographically, is not far from Greece, is it? Mm -hmm. They're close by. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, although they're geographically close, they have different cultures and different histories. Sure. And today, the majority of Libya is Muslim. So imagine if there was an event at the Vatican and it was dealing with uh, the Middle East and delegates from Libya were invited. And those delegates showed up and brought with them a statue of the ancient Greek god Zeus. And they set up the statue of the ancient Greek god Zeus and began worshiping it right there in the Vatican. That would make no sense. Why would right. they do that? Because number one, uh, Zeus was never a god of Libya. As a matter of fact, the Libyan people today are Muslim. The Islamic system is monotheistic. They would never worship another god, such as Zeus. But also, Zeus hasn't been worshipped by anyone in thousands of years. The same is true for Pachamama as a goddess of the Incan people. The Incan religion has been dead for a long, long, long time. There are no actual Pachamama worshippers of the Incan variety left. Now, granted, mm -hmm. New Age people everywhere, New Age people or um, modern day uh, people trying to reinvent old religious beliefs. They may be claiming Pachamama and using her name, but as an Incan goddess, there's no veneration for her anywhere in the traditional Incan sense. So hearing this was just as nonsensical to me as if Muslims from Libya showed up at the Vatican with a statue of Zeus to worship. Um, the religious systems are very different and they're different cultures altogether. And that's the same thing when you deal with the Andes and the Amazon. The Amazon. They may be next to each other. They both, both may begin with the letter A, but they're very different cultures with different religious traditions. So that, number one, set off red flags for me. But then I decided to watch the video of what actually happened. And we're going to go through the video here in a few minutes. But I, when I watched the video, I, I could see what was going on. I could see exactly what was taking place. It was very obvious to me. I recognized the event. And for me, as somebody who studied this stuff for years and teaches it, I mean, it was pretty simple what was going on, which was they were praying for the Amazon and for the people of the Amazon. It was very clear to me. And it was very clear to me these people were Catholic as well. Um, so when I heard this, uh, I thought I'd try and just calm people's fears and say, hey, wait a minute. Um, I watched the video. It's very clear that what's going on here is a prayer service for the Amazon, in which these people are praying for the Amazon as a place and the Amazonian people. And I was met with a lot of very hostile opposition, mm -hmm. people who were convinced of the narrative that it was idolatry and that Pope Francis, Pope Francis sanctioned idolatry. And many of these people are, are really good people, like really good, faithful, devout Catholics, including many uh, priests and deacons that I know, you know, good, holy priests and deacons that I respect were convinced that this was an act of idolatry. Mm. And when I tried to explain to them that it wasn't, and I tried to give them the reasons why, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. Um, it's almost like they wanted to believe that the Pope was guilty of idolatry. Mm. Um, I hope that's not the case, but that's how it seemed to me like they wanted to believe this happened. I think part of it is that there were events leading up to the Amazon Synod that caused a lot of stress. Uh, people were afraid that the Amazonian Synod would result in... Um, 
the ordination of married men. Mm. Uh, that was a big concern. There also was fear that it would lead to religious syncretism. Mm. People saw it as a Trojan horse for other agendas. So already there was a lot of suspicion about the whole event. So when this happened and something happened that appeared very foreign and very strange, um, you can see why people jump to the worst conclusion. I can understand why. Uh, but they're approaching with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Ah. <laughs> and I was always taught in both theology and philosophy mm. that you approach things with a hermeneutic of charity, where yeah. you try and look for the best possible interpretation. So I, I would take the interpretation that, number one, these people were Catholic. Uh, mm. The people from the Amazon who came were all Catholic. They were not pagans. They were Catholics. Mm. Uh, I would take the approach that my first assumption would be that fellow Catholics wouldn't be worshiping a pagan god mm -hmm. from a different region thousands of years ago. I mean, that'd be my first assumption. Yeah. Uh, my second assumption would be that the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, the Holy Father, even if I don't agree with him on everything, wouldn't be sanctioning idolatry in the Vatican. Mm. If he saw idolatry, I imagine he would shut it down. I mean, that'd be my first assumption. Um, but people were taking the opposite approach. I can imagine right now the chat is probably on fire with people who are upset about this. Um, Not yet, okay. <laughs> but, it, but they will be. <laughs> they will be. So here's there will be to... there will be some who are upset and some who agree with you. Yeah, and I think we... the whole image itself, this so-called Pachamama statue, has become yeah. a Rorschach test. You, you know, I, I actually, by the way, I, I hate to cut you off, but I, I would just wanted to follow up with what you said there. I did a poll because I just want to know what the viewers are saying, be, regardless, however, we're going to offer this presentation. But I wanted to see what they thought. And here's the poll. 106 people have voted so far. Yeah. And um, here's what they, they've said. I asked, was the Pachamama ceremony at the Vatican idolatrous? 32% said yes. 43% uh, said no. 25% said, show, just show me the results. So they, they didn't uh, weigh in. So it sounds like, you know, people are kind of split down the middle on this, which I'm not surprised. About. But that's actually better than it was two years ago. Two years ago, um, probably yeah. the, the Catholic sphere was that this was definitely, without a doubt, you know, uh, pagan idolatry at its worst. You know, I, I used to initially when I first saw this, I thought that this was idolatry. Right. And what got me questioning that, however, was was a specific part from the ceremony. Somebody pointed out to me some of the words that were said that made me had to start questioning that. But we'll get to that later. Yeah, we'll get to that when we go through the video. Um, yeah. And, you know, I can't blame people for, for seeing idolatry because mm -hmm. it's very foreign to most people. Mm -hmm. And there's a temptation when you see something foreign that doesn't make sense to assume the worst about it. Yeah, I'll give you an example. A number of years back, I, I knew a fellow um, who, an acquaintance, and he decided to visit a Byzantine Catholic church, something I'm familiar with, something you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I would encouraged him to go. Well, after he went to the Byzantine Catholic church, he contacted me and wanted to talk. Mm -hmm. He was very upset because he had never seen such horrible disrespect for Christ in the Eucharist. Like, what do you mean? And he said, well, first of all, nobody was kneeling. Um, there was no kneeling going on during the liturgy. People were standing. And as he believed, um, you, you kneel to show reverence. You stand when you're not being reverent. Um, now, as a Byzantine Catholic, you know what the truth is here, right, Michael? Right. Which is, if in the Byzantine tradition, standing is a greater sign of respect than kneeling is. Yeah. In the Byzantine tradition, you kneel to show penance, you stand to show reverence. But he right. saw us standing during liturgy and assumed we were just disrespecting our Lord. Right. But then what really upset him was, and I'm going to use his words more or less, he said, you know, at the end of liturgy, they brought out our Lord, the body of Christ, in a basket and held it there. <laughs> And people just came by grabbing it like it was bread and eating it. The, the prosphora. <laughs> he was extremely upset with it. He never saw right. such tremendous disrespect for the Eucharist. And he was right. actually angry. He was enraged. Sure. Can you blame him? He, well, he jumped to the worst conclusion, right? Sure, sure, When sure. I explained to him what happened, that number one, we were standing out of reverence, and number two, that that was not the Eucharist, that that was just blessed bread uh, given at the end of liturgy, he calmed down. It, it made sense to him. 
But the point is, when he didn't know what was going on and saw something strange and foreign, to him, it, it, it appeared to be something downright blasphemous. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing is happening here. People are seeing a ritual that seems very strange, very foreign, and without understanding the symbolism behind it, I can see why they would think this is a pagan ritual. I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not going to say that this ritual was perfect or this was handled very well. Sure. Uh, Pope Francis, love him or hate him, I think he's a general policy of not responding to his critics. Mm -hmm. So he never explains himself. So when something happens that people misunderstand and misinterpret, he typically just ignores the critics rather than explaining it. Mm. I think in this situation, explaining what happened might have been the way to go. Yep. One of the best articles I read about this from a critical perspective was from, uh, I believe it was Father Raymond D'Souza. Okay. And he wrote an article saying that whatever happened here, it should have been accompanied by some sort of cate cate catechesis. Sure. This would have been an opportunity for people to explain things. Mm -hmm. So we understood things uh, that never happened. And that probably was a missed opportunity. Yeah. I'm going to try and do that today, actually. I'm going to try and give that catechesis, you know, two years too late. <laughs> but um, better late than never. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was trying to explain it at the time, but no one wanted to hear what I had to say. Uh, Understood. They were not interested. Understood. Because, I, I can only imagine. You know, when, they, they, wanted, they had a narrative that they wanted to believe mm -hmm. in. Um, I, I know what you're experiencing because when I started to question that narrative, that's the moment I saw a lot of people turn on me and start to call me a demon worship defender. And yes. I know that I'm not defending demon worship. So I, I said, wow, when people did that, I realized, hmm, uh, if they're doing that to me, I wonder if they're doing that to Pope Francis as well. And sure enough, they were. So that really got me questioning a lot of things. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and I was meeting responses of a similar level, not quite as extreme as that, but people were accusing me of defending the indefensible. Mm -hmm. But I was basically an apologist for idolatry. <laughs> now, what I want to point out here mm -hmm. is that all of us are Christians. We're followers of Christ. And Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about truth. What matters more than anything in a situation like this is that we look for the truth and that mm -hmm. we're open to the truth. What The truth as to what actually happened here is extremely important even if the truth doesn't fit a narrative. And we're all guilty of this. You know, yeah. if you're a Democrat, you hear a, a story about a Republican doing something wicked, you're likely to believe it. Same thing if mm -hmm. you're a Republican and hear a story about Joe Biden, you're likely mm -hmm. to believe it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes these stories we hear are not true, but we want to believe that they're true. Sure. But the, the actual truth, what really happened matters. Truth matters. We have to be careful of falling into an error of the communists um, you know, communist thinkers such as Trotsky would advocate the view that truth was malleable, mm -hmm. that there really was no objective truth, mm -hmm. and that you could bend facts, you could bend the truth to serve a moral purpose. As Christians, we do not believe that. We believe right. the truth is objective, truth is right. real, and we have to look for it. So we have to really look at the truth here. Was this an act of idolatry, of pagan idolatry of the Incan goddess Pach Pachamama, or was it something else? And I think and, people were not curious enough to look into the truth. They just wanted to believe their set narrative. I'm going to pause there and let you ask a question or make a Yeah, because you're touching on a point that I think is very difficult for all of us, myself included. I, I had to work through this personally. It's hard to question some of these things when you've publicly taken a stance on something, or at least at the very least internally taken a stance on something. And you now have to admit that you could be wrong. That's hard to do for some people. Um, again, whether it's a public stance or just an internal stance, sometimes there's pride there and it's very difficult to say, okay, let me consider this new data. Maybe I was wrong here. Maybe I slandered the Pope. That's a difficult decision to you know make, to be open to, well, maybe I'm guilty of a major sin here. Maybe I publicly uh, sinned against the Holy Father by accusing him of idolatry or somebody else of idolatry. That's a very difficult thing. So, and, th and that is a serious accusation, by the way. Accusing anyone of idolatry is very serious, yeah. whether it's the Holy Father or whether it's our fellow Catholic Christians from the Amazon region. Because yeah. in my opinion, they're the victims in all of this, because these people came 
in many cases to Europe for the very first time. And they're exposed to a world they weren't familiar with. Mm -hmm. And they perform a prayer service is really what it was. It wasn't a ritual, it was a prayer service. And they're being accused of being pagan idolaters when these people were all actually devout Catholics. Um, I feel bad for them. I think they were really slandered in this and that's not fair to them at all. But I'll, I'll explain more as I explain what was happening during the ceremony. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point to, to mention those people who were slandered. But, you know, the ongoing narrative has been focused, especially on Pope Francis at this point. I've seen people justify anything and everything as far as disobedience to the Pope, slander against the Pope, because of this incident, more satitia and the death penalty. Now, I've already addressed the more satitia in multiple shows as well as the death penalty. But and, and I've talked a little bit about the Pachamama issue, but never from your angle and your level of expertise. So that's why I decided to get you on here to speak about this, because those are the main things that I hear people use to defend all kinds of dissident, schismatic positions against the Pope. So, uh, you know, go, go ahead and take it wherever you want. I'd I've seen that as well. Yeah. 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 So um, in a moment, I'm going to start the video, but first I want to make a comment. Okay. I'm going to ask everyone to watch the video with me mm -hmm. and to not pay a special amount of attention to the wooden statue in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. I think part of the confusion here is that because the statue is there, people are assuming it's the focus of attention and the focus of prayer. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to point out though, was that that statue was not there by itself. What actually was there was a blanket with a, a artistic representation of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And on that blanket was a whole bunch of different artifacts. These were all symbols or artifacts that represent the people of the Amazon. That statue was just one of the things on that blanket. As a matter of fact, that there, there were two identical statues like that on the blanket, two of them. And I want people to look at the video and just consider that maybe the words they're saying and the gestures they're performing are not directed towards that statue. That there were other objects there and maybe the attention was not on the statue, but on something else, okay? okay. People and consider that, consider there's a possibility at least. At least okay. that as a possibility. And, and I'll explain why. I'll explain why. Yeah, that, that's fair. And I do want to say, everybody, hold up. I know you're going to throw in a million comments that I'm already seeing them. But the Pope said this. He called it Pachamama. You have the... We're going to get to that. But yes, we'll, we'll get to that for sure. <laughs> One thing at a time. So hold the, off on that, y'all. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out as well is that particular statue, mm -hmm. the wooden statue of the pregnant woman, the mm -hmm. naked pregnant woman, is not an ancient Amazonian artifact. It's not an old idol. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's pretty new. It was probably created in the past 10, 15 years, if not sooner. Um, from what I could tell from the research I did, it was actually created by an artist in Brazil, in the Amazon region. Uh, what happened was there is a, a, a group in the Amazon of Catholic missionaries. Um, I think they're called the Pan Amazon Catholic Network. And they've been organizing a lot of the missionary activities throughout the Amazon together with the Franciscans. And um, they actually went to a local artist and asked about an image that could be used to represent the Amazon. Not for worship, not for any ritual, just an image that could be used to represent part of what their movement stood for. You know, uh, very often move, uh, movements will try and get logos <laughs> or an image that represents them, you know. Sure. I've been to McDonald's that have that in the past at least had statues of Ronald McDonald in front of them. I remember. You don't that. see them much anymore, but as a kid, no. I saw that all the time. Yeah. Um, you remember that probably. Oh, yeah. 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 And um, <laughs> this was that kind of a thing for this group. They weren't creating an object to be used in worship. They weren't creating an object being used for um, rituals. They were creating a, like a a logo in a sense, a, a statue to represent the movement. And the image itself was meant to represent the Amazon. And they took it to some conferences and stuff and different events in the region, but it kind of caught on and people kept buying more of them from the same artist. So keep in mind that this was never approached as a sacred object. This was a work of art created by a living artist in Brazil. It's very new. 
This is not an ancient pagan idol. This is a new item. All right, we have to consider that. And uh, apparently in some places, the natives, the indigenous peoples on their own, began referring it to it as a Marian image, calling it Our Lady of the Amazon. This just happened spontaneously. They associated it with Mary, probably because it's a woman, a mother who's pregnant. And, you know, Marian imagery can take different forms. And it's not unusual for cultures that are recently Christianized to adopt pagan elements and Christianize them or to look for things they can associate with Mary. In this case, it wasn't even a pagan element. It was simply a, a new work of art that was created in the past 10, 15 years. So consider that that this object they brought is one of many objects they brought to represent the Amazon, and that it, it was a new object. No one would think of it as being a god or an idol because it was it was like a statue created by a living artist in New York City today. It'd be like the equivalent maybe of showing up with a you know a painted a painting by Andy Warhol or something. Something that represents you, something you appreciate, but not something of deep religious significance necessarily. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. All right. Hopefully everyone's following me with an open <laughs> mind. That's all I'm asking for tonight is an open mind, please. An sure. open mind. Sure. And I want to be clear, if I believed idolatry was taking place, I would condemn it. Mm -hmm. I will not tolerate idolatry of any kind. Right. Um, I'm not being an apologist for anything or anyone. I just want the truth to take precedence. So with that being said, how about we start the video? Um, Let's do it. Okay. Uh, let me add that to my screen. Uh, Y'all. Okay. It's going right. now. I'm going to jump ahead a bit to, mm -hmm. there's some opening stuff, um, nothing remarkable, just local people and people from the organizations welcoming the Pope. San Francesco. So I'm going to start right here at, right before the next speaker. The first few speakers were, again, people just welcoming the Pope and making some general comments. But the next speaker here is actually the opening prayer. And I want people to see this prayer in its context, because this prayer is actually um, a prayer in the name of the Trinity, and it's a prayer that quotes heavily from the Canticle to Creation by St. Francis. So the priest here is talking about, uh, well, he's praying for the Amazon, praying for the people, and he quotes extensively from St. Francis's Canticle to Creation. You're familiar with that, I'm, I'm sure. Yes, yes. You know, the, the, the sun, the moon, the earth. He quotes from that extensively. But keep in mind this was taking place on you know, the feast day of St. Francis. And this event had a stated purpose. The stated purpose of this event was to pray for the Amazon and to pray for the people of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. Now you may be wondering, why were they praying for the Amazon. Well, the Amazon as a place is actually endangered. Um, there are a lot of corporations in that region who are trying to take over the land. And by, by the way, can you turn them down just a little bit? So, because oh, sure. they're they're at the same volume as you. Yeah. Is that, is that good? That's a little bit better. Yeah, go ahead. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So did anyone hear anything I just said or should I repeat yeah, it Yeah, I, I heard you, but if you want to maybe just briefly summarize it because some people may struggle with okay. that part. So uh, I'm going to pause there and just say, so the priest was giving a uh, an opening prayer in the name of the Trinity in which he quoted extensively from St. Francis's Canticle to Creation. Again, this day took place uh, on the feast day of St. Francis. And part of the event was to consecrate the Synod to the Amazon to the protection of St. Francis. Mm -hmm. But also, and it was stated that they were there to pray for um, the people of the Amazon and for the Amazon as a region, because the region is endangered. There are a lot of corporations in that part of the world that are trying to take over land, and the native peoples there are fighting for their survival in many cases. So praying for the Amazon as a region is also a priority at this particular event, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So as the priest is doing his opening prayer, which I want to assure everyone is very Christian, it's an Italian, but he's talking about the Trinity and quoting from St. Francis, we see here the blanket. Some media referred to it under various names, but it, it was simply a blanket with an image of the Amazon. And on it, they placed objects that represent the Amazon and the Amazon's people. Okay. So you see two of those uh, images of the pregnant woman. 
you also see some fruit, you see, you know, artifacts like a pipe and maybe some pottery. It's all stuff that represents the people and what they're all about. You see a little canoe there with uh, mm -hmm. an oar because the Amazon river is a big part of their culture. Mm -hmm. Now, what you can't see here is if you pull a little bit further back, there actually are um, pictures of people around scattered around on the, on the mm -hmm. ground. And these are pictures of people who died uh, as martyrs in the belief of the indigenous people. So some of them are Catholic lay people. Some of them mm -hmm. are images of Catholic religious who died. Uh, one image that's given prominence is of a nun named uh, Sister Dorothy Stang, I believe. And she was a, a Catholic nun who was a missionary. She helped evangelize a lot of people. They called her the angel of the Amazon, but the uh, local corporations didn't like how she was uh, strengthening and helping the indigenous people and they had her murdered. Okay, so these people that are there are Catholic saints. Did I understand that right? Uh, in the eyes of the indigenous people, Catholic martyrs. Okay. They may not have been canonized though. Okay. Oh, yeah. But but they were Catholic martyrs. Yeah. Yeah. In the guys of the people. Yeah. Some might argue that they weren't really martyrs because they were killed for standing up for the indigenous people as opposed to standing up for Christ. But one mm -hmm. could argue that by standing up for the indigenous people, they were standing up for Christ. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So, but again, these are images of people who are Catholic who who died trying to help the people of the Amazon. Okay. So those images are around as well. So you need to have some context, right? Sure. So there's a picture of a nun right by there who, who died for these people. So the priest is finishing up his prayer. And again, you can look it up, but it's largely a quotation from St. Francis's Canticle to the Sun. Yeah. And then after that, the next fellow comes up, this priest. And this priest is introducing the group. He is introducing a delegation of indigenous people from the Amazon. And what he's saying is that they brought with them artifacts that represent their culture and artifacts that represent the people and the Amazon itself. Okay. And that some of the things represent, uh, his words are along the lines that some of the things represent the earth, some things represent water, some things represent, you know, the sky, and that there are things that represent uh, the, the saints who died, the martyrs as well, is what he's okay. saying. Now, representing water, earth, stuff like that, is that animism? No, what that is, is appreciation for the Amazon as a place. Okay. Now we have to understand that there may be echoes of animism in their variety of Catholicism, but again, that's not unusual. Um, the main echo of animism here would be showing respect for nature mm -hmm. and understanding that nature is almost like a mother to us. Sure. But that does not mean you're worshiping it. Sure. They're and, not worshiping these things, but they have respect for them. And those things represent the Amazon region to them. You see that the people of the Amazon, even the Catholics, view the Amazon as a mother because it gives them life. It sustains them. But they don't worship it as a god. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? It does. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important to note that there are plenty of echoes, if you will, that have come from paganism in Catholicism as a whole. They've been baptized. They're not um, They're not pagan as far as they're somehow um, evil in and of themselves, right? I mean, there's nothing right. that is evil in and of itself that can be baptized into the faith. But, you know, like the wedding ring that I have on came from paganism, but there's nothing wrong in and of itself with a wedding ring. Now, you can't baptize something like idolatry, right? That, right. That's not something that can be brought over into the Catholic faith. But in, in animism, respect for nature is, is fundamental, and that can be brought into Catholicism without a problem. Mm -hmm. Because they're not worshiping nature as a god, but they do have respect for it as something sacred, something right. that helps sustain their livelihood, sustains them. Okay. So yeah. he's inter he's introducing this delegation, and the delegation is going to arrive. And I want to be clear: it's confirmed that all of these delegates are Catholic. Not one of them is a practicing animist. Not one of them is pagan. These are okay. all Catholics who came as delegates to represent the indigenous people. So they're going to come in. And now we're going to get really interesting because as they're coming in, I'm going to turn the volume slightly. They're singing a song. Now, various news outlets were describing this song as being a pagan chant. Some were claiming it was a pagan ritual or, or a, uh, you know, an Incan ritual. 
So there's a lot of talk about this pagan chant they were doing as they came in. Mm -hmm. but actually, the priest who introduced them t said exactly what the song is. It is not a pagan chant. It's actually an indigenous folk song about arriving on a river. The name okay. of the song is I Rowed, like rowed a boat. You'll see that some of them are carrying oars. Mm -hmm. They're actually singing a folk song about traveling someplace, going on a journey on a river because they journeyed here. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and you can turn, somebody's saying you could turn the back up, background up just a little bit. That'll be fun. But if there's any part that you want us to hear the audio about, you can maybe turn that up even more specifically. Right. Now, to be clear from this point on, the audio isn't super important because mm -hmm. the recording itself is terrible. Uh, they mm -hmm. did not capture the audio well at all in this video. Mm -hmm. Probably because when this whole event happened, they didn't think anything of it. They probably didn't realize it would be examined like a, you know, a forensic crime scene. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the audio is terrible. Um, so you can barely hear anything they're saying. Sure. So I want to be clear that from this point on, most of what they're saying, I'm guessing at. Okay. Because you can't actually hear what they're saying. Okay. And they are speaking another language altogether. But even then, you can't translate it because you can't really hear them. Mm -hmm. But... The priest described the song, and it's a song about rowing on a river, an indigenous folk song. Okay. So you see, they have the oars and everything, right? Right. Now again, this is described as a pagan, as a pagan song, a pagan chant. It's a folk song about traveling on a river called "I right. Road." So now they're circling around the blanket. Now here's where people get really, uh, really confused. Mm -hmm. They see them circling the bl blanket, so they assume they're worshiping what's on the blanket. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're here to worship God. So why are they in a circle? Well, in indigenous religions, as a general rule, circles are seen as sacred. And they typically view a circle as representing the cycle of life. And circles are seen as sacred forms. Now, People may say, ha that's paganism. Well, mm -hmm. I also want to be clear that in most cultures, religion and culture are not separated. They're okay. one in the same. As a matter of fact, religion is a separate category, is a modern, modern uh, invention. Thinking of religion as something separate is a modern way of thinking. Throughout most of human history, religion was simply culture. The two went okay. together. So even though these people are Catholic, they brought over some practices that were part of their culture, right? They can't just throw away their culture. And part of that is praying in a circle. Mm -hmm. So they're forming a circle to pray. And again, that's something you'd find in any indigenous culture. Uh, forming circles to pray is pretty common in most indigenous cultures. I want to be clear on that. So that's where they're praying in a circle. Now, don't we consider things sacred insofar as they pertain to something like the liturgy or the worship of God? So the word sacred literally means set apart. Mm -hmm. So something is sacred in the sense that it's something special, something with deeper meaning. Um, so as Catholics, we talk about the liturgy being sacred, but also as Americans, when we talk about things like the, um, you know, the Declaration of Independence being sacred. Things that are special, things that are meaningful. You get what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. So they're forming a, a circle here because that's how people pray in that culture. So people see them forming a circle and praying, and they're assuming that they're worshiping what's in the middle of the circle. They're not. They're praying to God at this point. So if you take a look what they're doing now, they're holding hands or they're beginning to pray. Do you see this? Yeah. And again, at this point, the audio is of no use. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I can't even hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. I have it cranked up. You can't hear anything. It, it just, yeah. Recording is terrible, but they're singing a song and they're beginning to pray and they're holding different items and artifacts that represent their culture to them. One, one of them, I believe is holding a picture of a, uh, a martyred nun. So they do their little song. And again, I can't tell you what they're singing because mm -hmm. the recording is terrible. Yeah. Do we, but, do we have a transcript of it? By no, there's no transcript. Yeah. So, so we got to assume that they're not just sneaking in something idolatrous right. out of nowhere. Right. Yeah. And I want to consider, I want to also add in, if you look at the context, this was a Christian event. It began with a Christian prayer. Yeah. And then right after this, 
a bunch of Christian speakers speak about things that are Christian, things that are Catholic. Mm -hmm. It'd be pretty weird to have an event at the Vatican, you know, that begins with a prayer, has Christian speakers, and then in the middle of it, it goes to full pagan and then back to Christian again. It'd be right, pretty right. strange. Sure, sure. So we also have to consider the stated purpose of the event, which was to pray for the Amazon and to pray for the people of the Amazon. So, and the burden of proof would have to be on those who would assert that it's idolatrous. They would right. have to come forth with evidence that you, that you, you can't, you can't, you can't convict somebody of idolatry without evidence. All right. Uh, I, I, I always say innocent until proven guilty. That's very mm -hmm. true when it comes to idolatry as well. We know these people are Catholic. We can assume they're praying what the event is about, which is praying for their people, praying for their land. Mm -hmm. So this is another song they're doing. I don't know if it's a religious song or if it's uh, another folk song. It could be either. We don't know. There's no transcript and there's no audio, but we would assume in a spirit of charity that as Catholics, they're not sneaking in a prayer to an Aztec goddess. <laughs> right. <laughs> That'd be pretty out of character for any Catholic to be praying for an ancient Inca, praying to an ancient Incan goddess in the middle of a Catholic ceremony at the Vatican. Sure. And I know some people were really condemning that poor Franciscan brother there. Um, when all this went down, people were saying what a, what a, what a um, sacrilege he was and how he was an abomination to the Franciscans. He's a, an indigenous person who's a Franciscan brother praying mm -hmm. to God. And we'll, we'll see more of that here in a second. As soon as this little song is done, we're going to see them go into serious prayer mode. It goes on for a while. And by the way, uh, I watched multiple videos of this from different angles. Okay. In some videos you can see some things better than in others. During this whole event, for better or for worse, Pope Francis was very, very tired. Mm -hmm. And he appears to nod off on multiple times for long stretches. <laughs> so, so the idea that Pope Francis was there eagerly presiding over an idolatrous yeah. pagan ceremony. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at the very, at the very most he was sleeping through an idolatrous yeah. pagan ceremony yeah he appears to be totally nodding off off and on during this whole thing okay. depending on the angle you're looking at okay. but again you can see they're just doing their, their their dance and their song and again dancing isn't inherently pagan sure i mean a lot of cultures dance to show joy and celebration sure and dancing as a form of worshiping god is not unheard of either mm -hmm. um king david right? oh well oh, there there's there's a picture there you see our holy father <laughs> Maybe he's praying. I saw his hands move. So. We'll assume that he's praying. We'll assume that he's praying. He's in deep prayer. So here's when they begin to pray. So as they're praying, I want you to pay attention to where they're looking at. Are they staring at the statue with, with, with deep intent? Or are they looking somewhere else? Let's just watch with me and see where are they looking while they pray? Where are they looking? Mm -hmm. Prayer is about to begin. And the the stuff that he's wearing here, it's not, uh, is this inherently pagan or something like that? It's a cultural item. Okay. Okay. Some people interpreted that he was a shaman. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. This is a cultural item from the culture. It's what people wear in his group. Okay. Now, this lady here with her arms up, first mm -hmm. of all, note, she's the one leading the prayer. She's the prayer leader. Mm -hmm. Notice where she's looking. Mm -hmm. Where is she looking? Up to heaven. Up to heaven. You're going to see that they're all looking up to heaven while they're praying. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at the statue. They're not focused on the statue. They're not praying to the statue. They're praying towards heaven because they're looking towards God symbolically. Mm -hmm. So they're in a circle, which to them is like a sacred space, praying towards God in heaven. And this lady here, I, I feel bad for her because she got a lot of uh, horrible attacks. Mm -hmm. I saw multiple respected Catholic news outlets report that she was a pagan a pagan shaman. Okay. And uh, based on what evidence? The, the photo? She looks, she looks strange. Okay. So no actual evidence that she's a shaman. It's just based she's, on the appearance. Right. But multiple news outlets, respected outlets with, with large readerships reported that she was a pagan shaman on multiple mm -hmm. occasions. Mm -hmm. I looked up, I looked her up. Um, she's mm -hmm. actually a local tribal leader from her part of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And she is Catholic. She's very okay. Catholic. As a matter of fact, she stuck around for the whole synod and she did a few interviews in which she talks a lot about the church and about the faith and about the struggle of the Amazon people, but always from a Catholic context. She is Catholic. She is not it, a pagan shaman. Is there evidence that she's somehow a syncretist? She's both Catholic and a shaman or something? I've seen. 
Okay, so no, ev- no, no evidence for that. So yeah. for those who would present that as a view, they would have to provide evidence for it. Provide evidence that she's a shaman, please. Okay. Uh, she is a tribal leader. Mm-hmm. And tribal leaders oftentimes engage in, you know, leading rites and rituals. But those mm-hmm. rites and rituals aren't necessarily religious. They're cultural. Okay. Kind of like, well, I'll tell you where I live, you know, 40 mm-hmm. minutes away, the <clears throat> leaders of the local community, they have a strange ritual where once a year, they bring out a rodent type creature called a groundhog mm-hmm. and they put it out there and they have it look for its shadow mm-hmm. and they make all kinds of predictions based upon that. Uh, mm-hmm. That sounds very pagan to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just at this point, it's part right. of the local culture, right. Punxsutawney sure. Phil, right? Sure, sure. So she's leading the prayer. And again, you'll notice they're praying towards heaven. See, they have their hands up in the orange posture. Mm-hmm. Again, they're all looking towards heaven, praying towards heaven. They're praying to God. Now, again, I cannot hear the prayer. No one can. There's no transcript of it. <clears throat> but the context was that they are praying for the people of the Amazon, praying for the Amazon. And that's why all of those things are in the middle of the circle. Those are things that, that represent what they're praying for. Mm-hmm. Or here is where the people go into overdrive. Look, they're bowing and worshiping the statue. Right. They're worshiping the statue. Right, right, right. Yep. Okay. That's the that's ground zero right there. Right. This is ground zero. <laughs> all right. I'll tell you what I saw. In mm-hmm. many cultures, in many religions, it's not at all uncommon to punctuate a prayer with a full prostration. Okay. That's very normal in many cultures all over the world. The people will pray, and then they'll end the prayer with a prostration or do a prostration in the middle of the prayer. As a matter of fact, uh, as an Eastern Catholic, you're probably familiar with this. Oh, yeah. We do a lot of prostration. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, during Lent, for example, we do the prayer of St. Ephraim. Mm-hmm. And multiple times during the prayer of St. Ephraim, we just stop what we're doing and make a prostration. Mm-hmm. When we're prostrating, we're worshiping God. Now, in my church, whenever we do the prayer of St. Ephraim, you know, people just go wherever they can to find space. Mm-hmm. We can't all be on top of each other doing prostrations. It doesn't work that way. You need space. So people spread out. So some people are in front of, are right behind the baptismal font doing mm-hmm. you know, the prostrations during the prayer of St. Ephraim. So while they're praying, while they're doing the prostration, the baptismal font isn't directly in front of them. Does that mean they're worshiping the baptismal font? Right, right. Of course. Sure. Right. You, you see what I'm getting at? These items are there in front of them. Not just the statue, but all of these items are in front of them because that's what they're praying for. But they're not praying to those things. They're praying to God, and they're punctuating their their prayer with a prostration. Mm-hmm. And again... I don't know what they're thinking. I can't tell you what's in their minds, but the most charitable and I think the most accurate assumption would be that they're they're praying to God and they're punctuating their prayer to God with a prostration to God. Okay. Does that make sense to you? It does. I'm following does you. Does it seem reasonable? I'm following you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, some people are going to say, but they're venerating deliberately the statue. They're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. They have to prove to me that the statue is the focus of that prostration. Okay. I th- the burden's on them to prove that. I think it's very clear that they're praying to God and the prostration is to God. It just happens to be that there are these items they're praying for in front of them. Mm-hmm. Which isn't just that statue, but a whole bunch of other A whole stuff bunch too. of stuff. The statue is just one of many artifacts Mar- they brought with Martyrs them. and other things. Yeah. Catholic Pictures of figures. martyrs, other things. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then the, pro- the prostration is finished. And now once again, they're going to pray upwards towards God. And here's, you see what I'm saying? They finish it by facing towards God. Mm-hmm. The prostration was just a punctuation of the prayer, mm-hmm. at the end of the prayer. Now, at this point, they're going to bring gifts to the Holy Father. Okay. So the lady there who's leading it, and people may say, oh, she's carrying you know, Morocco. That's clearly a pagan artifact of worship. No, it's a cultural artifact used in the culture as a form of, of celebration. Mm-hmm. So they're going to bring up gifts to the Holy Father. And notice one of the gifts is one of the statues. There are two of those statues there. They're going to give one to the Holy Father as a present. And, and it's it's just, if you want to pause it for a second, it's interesting with the Morocco point, because don't some of our garments that we use liturgically actually originate in paganism? I'm not saying that they're inherently evil or anything like that. I actually love our liturgical tradition. But so, I'm just saying, don't some of those things come from pagan elements? 
so as a as a deacon, when I vest before the divine liturgy, I put on I put on <clears throat> items of clothing that originated as civil wear in the pagan Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the liturgical censor, even though you do have some instances of that being used in the old covenant, it seems like a lot of that actually in, in the new covenant period adapted from the Roman Empire, if I'm not Correct. mistaken, and its use Correct. in the secular society and pagan so, society. We're going to watch them present the gifts to the Holy Father. And as they give the gifts, I want you to see how they react to the Holy Father after giving him the gifts. Just see what they do. So the, this lady is giving him a ring. Now, there was a lot of stuff written about this ring. It's called, I think call it a tokum ring. It's a special kind of ring made of a specific substance. Um, mm -hmm. I forget what it's made of, but it's something special. Okay. People were claiming that that ring is a symbol of liberation Marxist theology. Okay. Okay. It's true that that ring has been used by some liberation theologian people, but mm -hmm. that ring has much deeper roots in the culture. It's a sign of cultural belonging. So by giving him a ring that matches hers, she's showing that he is an honorary member of their tribe, of their culture. Got it. So it's not like inherently communist or anything. No, it's, it's she's basically saying, you're one of us. It's her way of saying to the Pope, you are one of us. So she's giving him a ring that matches hers. Okay. And look, look what happens next. Watch what she does. What did you just see there? Sure, the sign of the cross, yeah. The, that ancient pagan Incan ritual, the sign of the cross. Right. <laughs> from, from which demons flee. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So next, the lady is going to give him the statue of what she calls Our Lady of the Amazon, because at that, some of the natives interpret it as a Marian image. They called Our Lady of the Amazon. So she tells him it's Our Lady of the Amazon. He blesses the image. She gives it to him. And by the way, if that really was a, an image of an ancient Incan goddess that they worship, if that really was an idol, People don't typically give away their idols as gifts. Yeah. Now, didn't they say something there in the audio, Our Lady of the Amazon in Spanish? Yes, she says Our Lady of the Amazon. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly what she says. You can't really hear it too well, but that's exactly what she says, Our Lady of the Amazon. Here's a great question that I actually saw in the chat, and I want to I want to briefly address mm -hmm. it now before I forget it. Uh, not saying anything against Michael or Deacon, but why couldn't a larger news outlet do this early if Deacon could could find um, the info and couldn't a trained journalist? That's a great question. Why is it that news outlets didn't do this? Think about that for a moment. Do you want to comment on that, Father D? I can't say for certain why they didn't. Mm -hmm. But I think I think there are two types of outlets involved here. Mm -hmm. There are outlets that that weren't too concerned by the story and just moved on to other things because a lot mm -hmm. was going on during the Amazon Senate a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there were news outlets that specifically had it in for Pope Francis, mm -hmm. and they saw this as an opportunity to discredit the entire Senate. So those news outlets that did comment on this, ask yourself that question: Why didn't they do a play-by-play -play of this? Ask right. that question. I think that's a great question to consider. But in fairness, uh, you know, most most news outlets don't have a staff member who has a lot of experience you know, studying and teaching uh, indigenous religions. But they could reach out to somebody who does. It wouldn't be too hard to call somebody. Most universities have somebody like me. Sure. Um, so she gives him the statue. And calls it Our Lady of the Amazon. Our Lady of the Amazon. And then, finally, this fellow brings him a necklace. Mm -hmm. Again, the necklace just symbolizes their people. It's a way of mm -hmm. showing that he's part of their culture. And he wants to put it on the Pope himself to show that he's one of them. Again, this kind of thing happened all the time with Pope John Paul II. And then notice what he does. He crosses mm -hmm. himself because he is also Catholic. These people are all Catholic. They're not pagans. Mm -hmm. And then at this point, they do another song, and you're going to see what happens here. We're nearing the end of the segment we're looking at, but they're preparing to leave. Mm -hmm. They're going to do another song, and they're going to process out. And again, I can't tell you what they're singing because the audio is so bad, and there's no translations out there, no transcripts. But we can assume it's the same theme they've been going with all along, which is a celebration of the people and the culture of the Amazon and a prayer to God for the Amazon and its people. Mm. 
And again, you know, people are just kind of sitting there watching. Nobody watching this thinks this is remarkable, by the way. Um, <laughs> You, no one sitting there is thinking, oh my gosh, I'm watching the abomination take place. Right. God is going to send a plague to punish us now. This is like an ordinary ho-hum thing. And this kind of thing happened with Pope John Paul II all the time. And we're actually going to do a video on that, the Assisi yeah. thing. That's going to be a separate video. And so now they're leaving. They're leaving, right? Mm -hmm. That was the whole ceremony right there. The, the whole the whole abomination was mm -hmm. that. Um now, and as they're leaving, I, they all uh -huh. stopped to to you know basically get a to say goodbye to Pope Francis, um, to show him respect. You can tell they actually admire him and they love him because they're Catholic and they like the Pope. Mm -hmm. There used to be a period of time in which Catholics did like the Pope. That used to be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. So do, <laughs> those old times. <laughs> but do do you do you see why maybe somebody who isn't familiar with what's going on culturally? Oh, do you absolutely. see why they would say this is bad optics? It looks scandalous. It looks like idolatry, and there should have been more catechetical instruction and it, clarification. And that is a legitimate argument. I think it is. I think. Okay. I think the best criticism that can be leveled against this is there should have been some catechesis as to what's taking place, especially once the scandal broke, there would have been a great opportunity to explain it. Yeah. Um, that never happened. That is a, very much a legitimate criticism. I can say that for certain. And I do but we have to see what happens here with this, because okay. these people are leaving. Mm -hmm. So they're going past the Pope. Some of them are asking for his blessing. <clears throat> and as they're leaving, watch what happens here. I'm going to point one more thing out to you. We're going to see once again the lady who was leading the prayer, who's been accused repeatedly of being a pagan shaman. Mm -hmm. I want you to see what she does as she leaves. I remember somebody uh, was talking about how they wanted to dig up that tree and rip it out of the ground. How yep. dare they plant that tree? How dare they plant a tree? How dare they? Right. Watch what the so-called pagan shaman does. Mm -hmm. That was the guy with the hat, by the way, who's also accused of being a shaman. Mm -hmm. Here's the lady who was accused of being a shaman. Watch what she does. Mm -hmm. She wants the Pope to bless her, and she crosses herself as she leaves. Mm -hmm. A pagan shaman would never do that in a million years. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. She wasn't there praying to an ancient Incan goddess. She was praying to God. Now, I, I have some questions here. Are you, by the way, done sharing yeah. the screen at the moment? I, how do I get the video off? Oh, it's going I, great. I, I got it. Yeah, so, okay, I, I, got, I have some questions here. First of all, um, the image itself, that's, again, ground zero, right? In the video, they call it Our Lady of the, Our Lady of the Amazon. So it seems that their intention was just to venerate the Virgin Mary at, at the most under this appearance. At the couple, most. At the most. couple questions here. Um there was leaked audio where Pope Francis refers to the image as Pachamama. What say you to that? Yeah, I remember when that happened. And I'll tell you why that, that hit me hard. Because at that point, I've been trying to explain to many priests and deacon friends of mine that it was not idolatry, that from what I could see, these were Catholics praying in a way we're just not familiar with in the West. And um, they, they weren't really believing me, but some were kind of coming around. And then Pope Francis referred to this statue as Pac Pachamama. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, immediately they're like, aha, mm -hmm. we knew it. He's admitting they're worshiping the Incan goddess. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do now? <laughs> How do I respond to that? Um, what actually happened there was Pope Francis was addressing the uh, when the statues were stolen and thrown in the river. Mm -hmm. And by that point, the whole media was calling them Pachamama. All right. So probably without even realizing the context, he called them Pachamama because that's what the whole media was calling them. That had become shorthand for the statues. Yeah. So rather than saying, you know, the wooden statues of pregnant indigenous women, he said Pachamama. Sure. And that that was a mistake on his part. That was a gaffe. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he realized that that just confirmed that he was committing idolatry in people's right. eyes. But the truth is, he was simply using the shorthand term that everyone was using at that point in time. I was calling it Pachamama by that point, explaining what it was and what it wasn't. I was using that term as shorthand. And now, by the way, if you actually look at a real image of Pachamama, a true image of Pachamama, Pachamama appears to be an anthropomorphic mountain. Yeah. yeah. Um, ever seen the movie Moana? Yeah. And Moana, there's this goddess 
who's like an earth goddess who looks like a, an island. It's anthropomorphic. That's what Pachamama looks like. Uh, there's never been an image of Pachamama as a naked pregnant woman. Have you seen where you have versions of the Virgin Mary as that mountain? I'm going to add it to the screen right now. Have right. you? Um, well, among the, the people of the Andes region, um, Pachamama and the Virgin Mary, um, Pachamama being reinterpreted as an image of the Virgin Mary is not at all unheard of necessarily. Let me show that on the screen right now, because is this an instance where you have Catholics? This is way before the Amazon Synod. Is this an example where Catholics take some element from paganism and turn it into something Catholic? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And that can happen. So there are instances of Pachamama being viewed as an image of the Virgin Mary in the regions where Pachamama was worshipped, the Andes right. region, where the Incans lived. Um, right. th there, there's no reason why that would happen in the Amazon. Um, that being said, that being said, the term Pachamama, the name Pachamama isn't some inherently wicked, evil name. Mm -hmm. All it means is mother earth. Pacha means ground. Okay. Mama means mother. It's mm -hmm. mother earth. It's mother <laughs> earth. That's all it is. And veneration for mother earth is not uncommon in indigenous cultures. That's, that's a pretty normal thing. But do um, we as Catholics venerate created matter like Mother Earth? You know, venerating it as something special isn't necessarily a problem, provided we understand that it's an instrument of God. But we should never worship it. L like an icon? Is is that what you're getting at? Or The Earth can be viewed as an icon, absolutely. Okay. But it's never to be worshipped. But the Earth is not like... A, a, a person. So when we venerate an icon, it's a person who's made in the image of God. But the earth isn't made in the image of God. So how can there be this licit veneration of well, a representation of earth or something? I sometimes worship, I sometimes, I never worship an icon, but I sometimes venerate icons that don't actually show a person. Mm. There are icons of objects. Can you give me an example? Okay. Um, there's the icon of the holy napkin. Okay. Um, is it, isn't that the face, however, of Jesus though? Right, but the icon itself, the veneration is directed towards the object more so than towards a person. What about venerating the cross? Is that maybe an instance? Absolutely, yes. Venerating the cross as well, yes. And there are icons of the cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without so, Jesus on it, it's just literally venerating. Right. Which, and yeah. again, if you look at St. Francis's Canticle to Creation, it certainly strikes me as a veneration of creation. Okay. Now, now with that, the... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But you, but you would never worship creation. You would never worship Mother Earth. That's the difference. Sure. Now, with the incarnation, we have creation itself being impacted through the, through the incarnation, being sanctified, right. um, being united, if you will, to the Son of the Son of God, and not just not just humans, but the entire entirety of creation mm -hmm. is being redeemed, as we see in the Book of right. Romans. So there, there, and again, there are levels of veneration too, right? Yeah. Um, sure. The veneration we show towards an icon of our Lord might be different than a veneration we would show towards a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Is is this why we see like brother, son, sister, moon kind of language from St. Francis of Assisi, which they brought up, I think, didn't they bring that up at the beginning? Yeah, the, the opening prayer from the Franciscan priest quoted extensively from that, yes. So it's kind of the same same idea. Same okay. Same idea. And again... Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we need to go venerate the earth, but I'm saying that venerating the earth as something that reflects God's glory, uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, provided it does not lapse into worship. Pro provided we don't worship it. Uh, I, right. I see what you're saying. Now, with, the, with those proper distinctions in mind, now, <clears throat> what would you say to those who say, okay, well, this is a, if it represents the Virgin Mary, it's a really poor depiction of her. What, what would you say then? I wouldn't argue with that. That's okay. not how I would depict the Virgin Mary. Agreed. Um, I would say but, too, it's, a, it's an ambiguous image. Yeah. And ambiguous images, you know, can be potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally would not use it in worship. But that being said, going from it being an ambiguous object, ambiguous image to being an ancient Incan idol is quite a leap. Yeah. Now plus, I, would, I want to again emphasize that the focus of that ceremony was not the image. Mm -hmm. 
it was on a blanket with a bunch of other things that also represent also represent the Amazon people. But it became the focus after that because it, then they bring it into the church and have other ceremonies. With well, Ed. they actually had it all over the place. And I'll tell you why, because that image was representative of the, of the movement of the Amazonian Catholics. See, the indigenous Amazonian Catholics kind of adopted that as their image, right? Okay. That, that was something they, they related to. They saw it as something that represented them. So in the various churches, um, they would have various objects represented them. I remember seeing one church that had inside of it like a, like a little boat, and it had one of those blankets with a picture of the Amazon, and it had one mm -hmm. of those images. Um, but it wasn't the focus. It was just one of the things that represent the people of the Amazon. One one quick point, however, about depicting the Virgin Mary under this appearance, if if one wants to consider this the Virgin Mary, as we heard Our Lady of the Amazon in the ceremony, um, you know, some people say, "Look, she's bare breasted," and so that's that's profane. <sighs> Look, I don't think that the Virgin Mary should be de depicted that way either. But I've seen some medieval paintings where she's not only bare breasted, but other things are going on, which I find offensive. But I know that people at that time didn't find offensive. I've seen the uh, <laughs> classical works of art of Mary bare breasted with Jesus, um, you know, yeah, drinking. right. Yeah. And other things. And so it's like, yeah, you know, not my cup of tea. I, I don't prefer those images either. So in the same way that I would say, I personally wouldn't depict the Virgin Mary in this way. I also wouldn't depict her in the way some of the medievals did, um, in right. the West. So, and again, I'm, I'm not under the impression that the majority of Amazonian indigenous people necessarily see it as the Virgin Mary, but some do. Some That's do. what I wanted to get at. Because again, now in the ceremony, they call it that. Now there was a press conference where they then asked what this was. Was it the Virgin Mary? And one person, I forget his name, but <clears throat> he was speaking on their behalf and said it was something neither sacred nor profane. It basically represented Mother Earth. So he then goes on to say it's not the Virgin Mary. So some of the confusion comes from the ceremony calls it the Virgin Mary. Paul Francis then calls it Pachamama. And then the guy who clarifies in the press office says, it's neither sacred nor profane. <laughs> it's, it's neither the Virgin Mary nor something idolatrous. It's just mother, a symbol for Mother Earth. There's a lot of confusion about the image because it's an ambiguous image. There's no yeah. fixed meaning with it. Now, there's. Had, did you ever hear of the Italian Episcopal uh, Episcopal Conference prayer that they published about Pachamama? Do you remember that by any chance? When did this happen? This was in 2019. I, I want to get your thoughts on this because this was really this before concerned. or after the the uh, the the CC event. This was April 20. Um, let's see, um, April 2019 publication. Um, so this was this was before this event took place. Right, right. Um, now, I'm looking at catholicculture.org right now who published this in October, but they're saying it was um, released in April of 2019. I want to read this to you because a lot of people got concerned. I want to get your impression here. The Italian Episcopal Conference. Um, in fact, let me just share it on my screen. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So Missio, the pastoral agency of the Italian Episcopal Conference, published a prayer to Pachamama in an Amazon, April 2019 publication devoted to the Special Assembly of the Synod of Bishops for the Pan-Amazon region. The prayer described as a prayer to Mother Earth of the Incan peoples reads, Pachamama of these places, drink and eat this offering at will, so that this earth may be fruitful. Pachamama, good mother, be favorable. Be favorable, make that the oxen walk well, and that they not become tired. Make that the seed sprout well, that nothing bad may happen to it, that the cold may not destroy it, that it produce good fruit. We ask this from you. Give us everything. Be favorable, be favorable, um, or propitiated might be a translation. What what do you say of the, about that? Do you say that, hey, this is idolatry, or can you explain it? What, what I would comments? say is when people of white European background try and pander to indigenous cultures. It never goes well. <laughs> That's what I would say. I, I think, I think you're right about that. <laughs> but you see why some people are so confused, right? Because yeah, they're seeing this going on, 
Pope is calling it Pachamama. This other guy is saying it's, you know, Mother Earth. And now they're saying, be propitious, drink and eat this offering. Like, what are we sacrificing to some demon god here? And again, again, um, the Italian Bishops Conference put that together. And right then and there, there's a problem because they're talking about an Incan prayer. The Incans have nothing to do with the Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Their geography is all messed up. Right. Right. But I can see why people are confused. And again, I'm not faulting anyone for being confused. And I'm not faulting anyone for being concerned. Uh, mm -hmm. Could this have been handled better? Absolutely, it could have been. Mm -hmm. It could have been handled much, much better than it was. All I'm saying, and this is my sole point, is that from where I'm sitting, the preponderance of evidence is this was not an act of idolatry. No one was worshiping an ancient Incan goddess named Pachamama. The Pope was not worshiping an Incan goddess. Um, that's my point. Now, was the event vague and confusing? To the outside world, absolutely it was. Uh, I don't fault anyone for being confused, but I think we need to stick to the truth here. And the truth is that there's no reason to believe this was an act of idolatry. Now, let me show you something else on the screen, get your thoughts on this, because this was from kind of like a follow-up ceremony. They wanted to bring... Um, they brought this into St. Peter's Basilica. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about this ceremony, but people felt like, okay, the Pope defiled, you know, the center of Catholicism with this so image. Once again, we're stuff. seeing objects that represent the Amazon and its people. That's all that it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so you see the boat, right? Mm -hmm. Boat is very important in their culture because their life centers around the Amazon River. That's how they travel. Mm -hmm. That's why when they showed up, they sang a folk song about traveling on a river. That's how they get around. So you see the boat, you see various things, uh, and the statue is just one of the items on the boat. Again, these are things that represent the people and the culture they're praying for. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, you know, that that's pretty much all of the questions that I had um, and the things that I noticed that other people had concerns about. But I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions. So go ahead and put them in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology. We'll do our best to engage those if you have a few minutes. And I want to be clear also that I'm not a Pope Francis apologist in the sense that right. my interest is in promoting truth, promoting being followers of Christ. That's my sole interest. If somebody can prove to me that this was an actual intentional act of idolatry, that these people were there praying to a pagan goddess and not to our God, if they can prove that to me, I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong. Does idolatry have to be something that's intended or can it be just merely external? I, I mean, whenever you pray, intention's important, right? Mm -hmm. What are you praying towards? What are you praying? Mm -hmm. What's Who are you directing your prayers to? Again, that's always you know, about intention. And I'll send chat questions to reason and theology. Go ahead and put them there. Um, any while we're waiting on those chat questions, any concluding remarks, anything that we didn't get a chance to touch on that you wanted to throw? Yeah, in? yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna get some hate over this. I'm kind of expecting it. Welcome once, to my world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's your that's your, your world for sure. Absolutely. Another day in the office. <laughs> but you know, I'm in good company with with you and the many Twitch streamers playing the Harry Potter game right now. They're all getting hate as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember you, you You take the position it's um, not idolatry. I'm sorry, not idolatry, but it's not evil. And there are some people who believe that Harry Potter is just evil at its core. Right now, there's a Harry Potter video game that came out called Hogwarts Legacy. Mm -hmm. And people are playing it on Twitch and they're getting bullied uh, because they, people hate J.K. Rowling for her belief that a man can't magically turn into a woman. This is from Marie. This is so helpful. I originally thought that idolatry had happened. I'm, well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, okay, so let's see here. Do you think there's a little Eurocentrism involved in trad criticism of this? Not intentional racism per se, but a misunderstanding of anything indigenous. I think any any culture has a tendency to view things that are foreign as being suspicious. Yeah. So you, yeah. you see something you're not familiar with, people are suspicious. That's just what happens. I uh, from full metal he says i have questions um i just want or i don't have questions i just want to say god bless you father deacon this really helps me well thank you that made my day um is it okay if i embedded this video on where pity or is uh, mike lewis says i have no problem with that what about you father deacon oh please please do please do okay yep you got our permission um 
Jimmy Akin likes Harry Potter. Lots of trans stop listening to him. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, according to one of the trolls who called in on one of the shows, um, Jimmy Akin is also evidently, according to the troll, a heretic because he believes that aliens could exist. The heresy. Oh, my gosh. The heresy. <laughs> and you know how it's heresy, according to the troll? He tied it into Chalcedon. You know, <laughs> because really? because Christ is incarnated here into humanity, and he somehow wants to say in a parallel universe and this and that he's not incarnated. So there's heresy here. I don't know how we go from aliens to a parallel universe. I'd have to go back and listen to it. But it was a really w interesting uh, uh, argument. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. I, I, I sent that to Jimmy, and, and he laughed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we both enjoyed it. We shall pray for Jimmy's soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see what else we got in the chat um uh, roca says thank you and god bless you both very insightful and very helpful uh tyler says uh just want to thank you guys for all your work my priest and i sent the paperwork over and i hopefully should be officially visiting ukrainian catholic soon awesome welcome that. welcome yeah uh thank you so much for your guests so honest refreshing every catholic could be accused of idolatry you would think we might know better by now Look, I look. I I personally have fault in this. Again, at, at the time when I originally saw this, I thought that this was idolatry. Um, and, and again, then, I can't again, fault you for that because anyone who saw it without context would think that. Yeah, I, and and when somebody pointed out the context of the audio, saying, "Well, no, they're they're saying it's Our Lady of the Amazon," I'm like, "Okay, well, I do need to consider that." But then he calls it Pachamama, and then this and that, and then it's neither sacred nor profane, and so got to work through those kinds of things. Um, so I get why somebody would be very confused here. Uh, okay, here's a good one from Thomas. When does assimilating culture become transgressive or sinful in worship, prayer, rites, and so on? I'd say when it compromises the faith. Okay. So it's one thing to assimilate culture and to Christianize it. It's another thing to take in an aspect of the culture, which is completely in opposition to Christianity and try and water down Christianity to accommodate it. Mm -hmm. That's when it's a problem. Some people want clarification about venerating an icon of an object. Can Deacon elaborate? Well, okay. It's hard but, to explain this if you're not from an Eastern Christian context, because in the West, you know, they have statues and they venerate them, but veneration plays a much more active role in Eastern Christian spirituality with all the icons and whatnot. But the idea is that we venerate that, which ultimately brings us back to God things that reflect God, like the saints, but also it is possible to venerate objects that also reflect God or reflect the saints even. I mean, we venerate relics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this one is from Teresa. I've never seen a naked image of Mary, the Blessed Mother. Would that not be sacrilegious? My, you might not be familiar then with medieval paintings of the Virgin Mary, which I personally criticize the, the prudence of some of those pictures, but... Yeah, uh, that's my I, personal opinion. And, and, and I'd, I'd take more fault with those than I would of an indigenous image of a naked Mary, simply because people like to have Mary and Jesus reflect their culture, right? So they make images of Mary and Jesus in the likeness of themselves. In many indigenous cultures, women were typically topless most of the time. It was not seen as a sexual <laughs> thing at all. So creating an image of a topless Mary who looked like them, if that happened, they can't be faulted for that. That being said, I want to remind everybody that this is not really an image of Mary per se. This is a piece of art created by a local artist in the past decade or so. To those who argue the name Pachamama is inherently a problem because it has been worshipped as a deity, could we argue there are names such as Dionysius that come from paganism? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, if you look at most of the saints, their names were originally pagan names at one point. Yeah. Uh, your guests should be doing Vatican PR. <laughs> 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 I, I think that there was a missed opportunity here um, at this time to really give a level-headed presentation of the situation on part of the vast majority of people. I yes, think that... I, I think so. I, I think this was really a missed opportunity. And from what I read about the Senate, I was following the Senate that was going on for many reasons. As you know, there was a lot of buildup to the Synod that was very, very negative. And when the Synod itself actually was taking place, from what I've read, the people actively involved in the Synod weren't even aware of the controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't on their radar at all. Mm -hmm. And then 
when they became aware of what a controversy it was, it, they were kind of surprised by it. And by then, the story had really exploded. Um, but they should have taken the opportunity then or sooner to really explain what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there's some legitimate criticism that they butchered that when it comes to explaining what happened. Again, because we got multiple things. You have Our Lady of the Amazon, Pachamama, neither sacred nor profane. What are people supposed to believe? Um, okay, so here's one for you. Was the prostration of the people before these statues an appropriate form of veneration? Is there a line, a line in terms of prayer posture? Right. So in their minds, they weren't prostrating before all those items in front of them. They're prostrating to God. Mm -hmm. um, those things just happened to be there. They just happened to be there because they were in a circle praying for their people, praying for the Amazon. Those objects represented what they were praying for, but they were praying to God. You saw that before the prostration, they were facing towards God. After the prostration, they were facing towards God. The prostration was just a punctuation of their prayer, which again, you find in many cultures. Now... <clears throat> Do we not also in the Byzantine tradition prostrate before icons of the Virgin Mary? Have you ever I've seen, seen it happen? I've seen yep. it. It, it. Would not. Would be you uncommon. say that's wrong? Would you say? No, I would wrong? not. Okay, I would not, um, because prostration doesn't necessarily imply worship. Mm -hmm. Now here's another one. It seems like Rome isn't very concerned about clarifying things for American trash. I I agree. I agree. I think they could have done a better job. But did he not in the apostolic exhortation explicitly condemn idolatry in it? Um, I, I, it's Pretty been a while since sure. I've read it, but I believe he talks about a healthy incorporation of culture, healthy enculturation, but he also draws the line at idolatry. I'm pretty sure that's pretty clear in the document, but it's been a long time since I've read here, it, so I here, can't say for sure. Here it is. Well, here's at least one part, I should say. I'm not saying that this is everything that he said on the matter. Um, it is possible to take up an indigenous symbol in some way without necessarily considering it as idolatry. So it, it's very clear he's not condoning idolatry. Uh, right. But this, this concept, this principle is actually very, very Catholic. It's a, a principle yeah. that you see going back at least to Gregory the Great. Yes. I mean, he, he talks about instances where... You know, people write to him. I think he's writing to Augustine of Canterbury, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he's writing to people and they're asking him, what do we do with these pagan temples? You know, um, and he basically says, look, strip them of all of the idols uh, and, you know, pray over the place. And then you start saying mass there. Like you don't have to destroy the pagan temple. You can right. you can pray mass there. You can turn it into a Catholic church. There's a long tradition in Christianity of taking pagan things and Christianizing them. A very long tradition. Now, here's one question that I have. I, I, I don't necessarily have an answer to it, so I'm curious to get your thought. Could Catholics, according to that principle, take an image of, I don't know, some pagan goddess and appropriate it to the Virgin Mary? Is that possible or is that impossible? You know, it's very possible that's already happened in the past. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, right. but it's not unheard of for people who are new to Christianity to relate Mary, Jesus, to things they already know and are familiar with. But it would be incredibly imprudent at the very I, least. I wouldn't recommend it, no. But yeah. it, it's, it's probably happened historically. I'd be surprised if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Wrapping it up here. Checking the chat. Um uh, let's see. Some of these are repeats. Well, before I forget to, there's one more thing mm -hmm. I wanted to address. Uh, I forgot mm -hmm. to mention this. Yeah. So earlier when I showed the video, you saw there are many different things on the blanket, right? There was another object on the blanket that got a lot of attention, a whole lot of attention. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a statue of a man laying on the blanket. Did you see that? Um, I did not. Do you, so there was a statue see, of a man lying on the blanket. Um, do I have it? I don't. Um, maybe I do. Um, no, I don't think I have it on me, at least not a, a good picture of it. Okay. So this was a, um, maybe I can find it. Hold on a second. I may have mm -hmm. it actually. If I have it, how do I share it? Um, you just put it on that screen that you have, you were using for the video and I'll add it to the screen. Okay. I think I can pull it up. Just give me one second. Cause mm -hmm. I, I, I have some screen caps that I took for this presentation. Let me see if I can find it. Um, somebody's asking the Vatican released a coin with a mother earth figure on this. Was this not related? I don't know about the coin, but we did address the mother earth issue earlier. 
So maybe, mm-hmm. maybe go and listen to that part. Yeah. Um, can, if it's not too much to ask, can Father Deacon describe the act of veneration? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. I, I have an image here. I'm going okay. to, um, let me know it, when you want me to add it to the screen. Okay. So let me just pull it up right now. See the pile of dirt. <laughs> On that video, the, the pile of dirt. Uh, I see a place to put slides. Um, Where to go okay. there? All right, I tell you what. Go ahead and um, discontinue sharing your screen. Okay, um, share screen. And then what do I do? Uh, let's see. Right now, I see the Vatican ceremony. Okay, I want to... Sh- so put the image on that video. Maybe you can pause the video. All right, I see a candle in a coconut or something. Uh, yeah, that's that's. Is that you doing that or is that the video? That's the video that you're playing. Well, here it is. There, there it is. There's, there's. Okay. The, there. How do I pause it? Okay, just hit the pause on the video. It won't let me pause. Ah. Um. There we go. There you go. Okay. There, there it is, right there. Where bottom right. Do you see an image of a man, a statue of a man lying there in the blanket? Bottom left or oh okay, I see it right next to yeah, Is my yeah. mouse visible gotcha. on the screen? Uh I don't see your mouse, but okay. I see what you're referring to. So it's on, on the left of the screen. On the left. There's this got a lot of attention as well in some circles. There was a statue of a man, and the report was um he was very phallic. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, I see. Mm-hmm. And that got a lot of attention. They, they had a, um, a statue with Viagra that they brought mm-hmm. with them. It turns out that's his arm. It depends on the angle you look at the picture from. Got it. From another angle, it's clearly his arm. Got it. Got so it. it I, rem- I remember yeah. that. Yeah, and I remember somebody had kind of conclusively shown that at the time that, no, yeah. that's not what it was. It was arm. Yeah. yeah. But that's that got a, a lot good of attention point. as well, so I wanted to clear that up while I'm at it. That's a good point. Um, weren't there elements of Our Lady of Guadalupe's dress that were pagan origin, or am I me- remembering that wrong? You are correct on that. Do you have any comments on that? I just recall that the symbolism in it spoke to the people of that region in that time period. Mm-hmm. But nothing inherently evil or anything like right. that. Right. Just, just things that can be appropriated. Things that were pagan in origin, but not inherently anti-Christian in any way. Again, what I said earlier, we have to remember... For most people, throughout most of history, culture and religion are one and the same. It's hard yeah. to really separate them completely. Do you think that there was an element of evil suspicion going on here? Just to, uh, again, recap, so, it's it's that kind of hermeneutic of suspicion. And... I would say the hermeneutic of suspicion was an overdrive. And I think there are people who are already angry with Francis, who are looking to discredit the Synod for whatever reason. Maybe for good reasons, even, they want to discredit it. Yeah. But they saw this as something that fit the narrative of Francis the heretic. And haven't you noticed that people have hung their hat on this and they've used it to justify every kind of, you know, schismatic angle and comment about Pope Francis? Oh, my gosh, yes. And, and you know, it keeps coming up again and again. I remember last year, uh, worldwide, we were doing a consecration of Russia and Ukraine to Our Lady. Remember this? Mm -hmm. And the prayer that they used for the consecration, actually, part of it came from the Byzantine tradition. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And part of it is imagery talking about Mary, connecting Mary with the land, Mary with the earth. You find that in some Byzantine hymns. And people were saying that Pope Francis was consecrating Russia and Ukraine to Pachamama. Yeah, I think Taylor Marshall had proposed that at one point. There were multiple yeah. people claiming that it was a consecration to Pachamama, yeah. when really it was a traditional Byzantine image. Right, yeah. So they they then, keep bringing this up over and over again. And and then they realized I, that and had to retrace their steps. And Right. Yeah. What I want to say is, though, there's something wrong. Okay, if you are a, a devout and faithful Catholic and you want to believe that the Pope is an idolater, mm-hmm. take a hard look at yourself. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. I think that's a good point. Yeah. I've had people get angry when I tell them the Pope is not an idolater. They get they actually get mad when you tell them that. Um, because they have to admit that they could have been wrong. Perhaps. And they could have engaged in serious and grave sin by yeah. either internally harboring, um, you know, sinful views or even publicly expressing them. I had some 
good friends, people I'm still friends with, people I, I love and respect who are upset with me for questioning the uh, idolatry narrative. They're upset that I was questioning it. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see that a lot. I get it every time I mention the Our Lady of the Amazon point from the Amazon Synod. I, I get that every single time. Um, but what I notice from that crowd is they don't really engage in any kind of really in-depth responses. It's just an emotional response. Well, Pope Francis called it Pachamama as if that's a slam dunk and there's no kind of response that could be offered to that. And That's know. usually where they go to with, is with that, yes. And, and then they try and put the burden of proof on me to prove it wasn't idolatry. Um, so you know, the Pope is an idolater unless proven innocent. Um, that's not how it works. Yeah. Well, uh, looks like I got everything um, uh, from the chat that was relevant. Any concluding comments you wanted to offer before we kill the stream? And I want to say this. Um, I'm not a Pope Francis apologist. Personally, I have a lot of respect for him, but no one is perfect and he makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. I think he'd be the first to admit that he makes mistakes from time to time. And being critical of what he does as the Holy Father is legit. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. But I would say that any criticism we level at him or anyone else, we need to be certain that it's grounded in truth. Mm -hmm. And we need to approach things with a hermeneutic of charity rather than one of suspicion. We need to give them the best possible interpretation rather than jumping to the worst possible conclusion. Well said. Father Deacon, thank you so much for coming on and doing this and clarifying this for us. Oh, thank you, Michael. Like I said, I really appreciate talking about this because for about two years, no one would listen to me. <laughs> I can only imagine. And we're, I'm going to have you back on. We're going to talk about John Paul II and specifically Assisi. That'd be great. I, I want definitely want to engage that one because that's a that's the that's the OG version of the Pachamama That's and There still are people who are harping on that after all these yeah. years. I still see websites going berserk over that. Okay, so we're we're gonna do that. Y'all stay tuned for that. We'll have a date on it soon. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, hit that like button and the subscribe button. Also, share this on your social media with people that you see are bringing this accusation against Pope Francis. If you see people bringing up the accusation against him or any others, saying that the Pope, the Vatican, it's idolatry, please share this with them. At the very least, they can have an opportunity to inform themselves before they continue to uh, spread that information. So, all right, that's gonna do it. We'll see you later. Bless. Is it possible that ancient aliens created other ancient aliens? Ancient alien theorists say yes, but then is it also possible that ancient aliens created the ancient alien theorists? And are the ancient aliens and ancient alien theorists led by the Vatican headed by the Pope? ancient alien theorists and certain unnamed catholic youtubers say yes tired of catholic shows that peddle conspiracy theories that sound like something out of an ancient aliens episode check out reason and theology for a more reasonable take